morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. I sort of feel like Roger Goodell hosting the NFL draft in his home, like he did uh, a month or so ago. My role today is to set the table by providing an overview of the macro environment and comment briefly on what's going on in the world of growth stocks. Let's start by looking at 2019. In 2019, the S&P gained 29% before dividends. And at year end, the market was selling at 18 times projected earnings of $178 for this year. 18 times, that compares to the long-term average multiple of about 15 times uh, forward earnings. Of course, in those other periods where we averaged 15 times, uh, that was those, and every one of those periods was a significantly lower interest rate environment. I'm, I'm sorry, higher interest rate environment. So today the market is around 2,800, give or take. It's 12% higher than when 2019 started, but it's about 13% lower than it was at the beginning of this year. Now, after a good economic performance in 2019, 2020 started with promise. Monthly unemployment gains were exceeding expectations. Wages were rising at a 4% rate. S&P earnings were expected to rise 8%. Those sluggish manufacturing PMIs had turned back above the critical 50 level, signifying expansion. Inflation, as Mario just, managed, uh, just mentioned, remained subdued. And by February 19th, the S&P had risen to a record, 33.86 for a year-to-date gain of 5%. But it was then, around February 19, that COVID-19 fears took over our economy and started holding it hostage, shutting us down state by state. On March 23rd, just over a month from the record high, the S&P was down 35% at 2191. This was the fastest 35% stock market decline in history the steepest bear market ever. And in a single month, around $12 trillion of stock market wealth vaporized. There was some talk of depression, defined somewhat vaguely as an extreme fall in economic activity lasting for years. In the midst of all this, however, in the midst of all this gloom, stocks then rose. In the five weeks after hitting the March low, stocks were rallied. 35% to 2953 on the S&P. And today, or on last night's close, we sit about 4% below that level. Now up until March, this economy had been gaining around 200,000 jobs, give or take, consistently for years. In March, however, the economy lost 870,000 jobs. Pretty bad, but nothing like April. In April, we lost 21 million jobs. That was the worst monthly job report in history. The unemployment rate went from 3.5% in February to 4.4% in March to 14.7% in April, the worst level since the Great Depression when unemployment was estimated at 25%. These employment numbers are consistent with an economy contracting at a 40% annualized rate in the second quarter, 40. Yes, there are some more optimistic forecasts out there that maybe suggest only down 25%. But now remember, these are quarterly numbers that are being annualized. So it doesn't, it's not as bad as it sounds when you see a headline that says GDP down 40% or something like that in the second quarter. The actual number might be more like nine, that's the quarterly rate. For the full year of 2020, the consensus for GDP right now is for a decline of 6.6%. As for earnings, the S&P estimates are no longer $178 for this year, they're about $128, which would be a decline, from 20, a decline of 21% from last year. But think about this. We transitioned from the lowest unemployment rate in 60 years to the highest rate in 90 years over the course of two months. And we suddenly find ourselves in a recession with apocalyptic-like numbers 
for GDP and employment. So why then, you ask, has the stock market rallied so hard since hitting that March low? In the wake of 85,000 deaths and over 1.3 million very sick people. Well, as you know, the stock market looks forward, not backward. It's a discounting mechanism, discounting the future. And the market is telling us that the economy is bottoming actually this quarter and is on a path to positive GDP growth in Q3, continuing in Q4, and continuing next year. So using quarter over quarter annualized rates, third quarter GDP is expected to rise 9 to 10% followed by a 5 to 7% increase in the fourth quarter. The consensus estimate for 2021 growth for the entire year right now is 4% growth. That's a Wall Street Journal survey that was conducted in the last two weeks. So giving rise to this optimistic view has been a robust policy response that you've already heard something about this morning. The policy response has been global, but here in the US especially strong with both monetary and fiscal policy. Let's dig into that fiscal, I mean, to the monetary policy first. During the Great Recession of 08, 09, it took the Fed 18 months to lower the Fed funds rate to zero. This time it took about a couple of weeks. When COVID-19 surfaced, the Fed did not hesitate. They called an emergency meeting on March 3rd and cut rates 50 basis points, not the typical 25. At that time, how many cases did we have in this country? about 100. On March 15th, two weeks later, not even two weeks later, when we had 3,000 cases, the Fed slashed rates 100 basis points to zero at the lower end of their target range. Now, the, now the Fed was not really trying to bail, bail out the stock market. The Fed is trying to prevent small businesses, which employ the majority of Americans, from failing. The Fed was trying to ward off a downward economic spiral. In those first two weeks of March, leading up to the 100 basis point rate cut, the bond market's plumbing clocked. So also on March 15th, the Fed announced a massive QE or quantitative easing program. And everything was on Chairman, Sh Chairman Powell's shopping list, except for stocks. It includes treasuries, mortgages, municipal debt, and corporate bonds, including those rated junk. Now, back in 2008, when the Fed started QE, it ended up taking them five years to expand their balance sheet by two and a half trillion, five years. This, this time it took six weeks. The Fed's balance sheet now stands at $6.7 trillion, about seven times what it was in 2008 pre-QE. And this is an open-ended program. The Fed's balance sheet will continue to grow. It's expected to reach 9.3 trillion by the end of this year. And looking forward two years, economists are widely forecasting a Fed balance sheet of $11.3 trillion. That level would be double the size reached after the Great Recession. On April 9th, the Fed wasn't done. On April 9th, the Fed announced the creation of lending facilities under which they can provide over $4 trillion of additional loans to small businesses. So in short, the Fed put in place the most aggressive monetary policy in history because this pandemic, pandemic is a major deflationary event and they wanna fight that tendency aggressively. Fiscal policy, you've already heard about. Congress acted quickly. April 15th, Congress Cares Act. They're granting over $2 trillion in cash payments, to households and small businesses. A new Congress Cares Act is being negotiated. That could be worth as much as $3 trillion. A lot of people need help, a lot of businesses still need help, and even the states, a number of states need help too. We're fortunate that COVID-19 struck after the lessons we learned in responding to that great recession of 08, 09. That gave us a blueprint for how to quickly respond and forcefully respond with both monetary and fiscal policy. We were also lucky that this happened when interest rates were the lowest they've ever been in history. This eases the pain of providing this financial assistance to both the public and private sectors. So stocks have responded. They've risen in response to the massive stimulus, but that's not all. They're also responding because they are looking at the gradual reopening of the economy. When you think about it, it's remarkable. 
we've had a recession for sure because this downturn spans two quarters. But in, when you look at it in months, it's really only, the downturn was really only a two or month, two to three month uh, recession. So it was bad, very, very bad for a couple of months and now we're gonna gradually heal. Now, of course, it's gonna take longer than a year to recover all of the GDP that we lost in March and April. And a vaccine is critical to the full recovery of the economy. Let's go back to earnings for a moment. So the bad news, which I talked about before, is that earnings on a year over year annualized basis could be down, well, it'd be down, you know, sort of like GDP, could be down 40% in the second quarter, but only down about 25% in the third quarter, and only down about 10% in the fourth quarter. But when you look at it on a quarter over quarter basis, Q3 and Q4, you're seeing earnings increase. They're not increasing month to month or quarter to quarter, uh, year over year, but they will be increasing uh, quarter to quarter sequentially. So the consensus now for this year is $128 of earnings, down 21% from last year's $166. I'm sorry, down 21% from last year, we had about $164, $5. The expectation for 2021 is $166. That would be a gain of 30% from this year's expected level of $128. Where the market is priced now implies a PE on those 2021 earnings of about 17 times. Investors are essentially looking at COVID-19 as an extraordinary item, as a one-time write-off. They are saying, ignore the earnings in the first half of the year, focus on a recovery in the second half, and focus on 2021 earnings estimates. And I think that's appropriate. Are stocks cheap? Well, they're certainly cheap relative to bonds. I would argue that a 17 multiple on 2021 earnings, which is about what the market seems to be discounting, would be attractive even if interest rates were much higher. If the 10-year treasury yielded 5%, maybe even 6%, you can make an argument for stocks. The so-called Fed model says bonds and stocks are in equilibrium when the bond yield equals the earnings yield, which is the inverse of the PE. But today, the 10-year treasury is at 60 basis points one-tenth of the 6% earnings yield based on those 2021 guesstimates. So the spread between the bond yield and the 2021 estimated earnings yield is 540 basis points. That's unprecedented. Let's go back to March of 09. That's when the bull market that just ended first began. At that point, the 10-year treasury yield was 3%, five times its current level, and more than double the earnings yield on the S&P, which was 1.4%. Let's talk about current income generation. The S&P has a dividend yield above 2%. That's three times that 10-year bond yield. In 2008, go back there again, when the dividend yield on the S&P exceeded very briefly by a small amount, the yield on the 10-year treasury. That was the first time that it happened since 1957. First time since 57. Well, it's happened again and to an extreme. When was the last time you saw the stock market yield exceed treasury bond yields by a factor of three? How about never? So yes, stocks are cheap relative to bonds. If the S&P goes back to selling at 18 times forward earnings and earnings recover to $166 next year, the market should sell at 3,000, up about 7% excluding dividends, and that should happen by the end of this year because we're going to be discounting those forward earnings. Of course, the issue is uncertainty. The level of uncertainty is greater than ever right now. Things could go horribly wrong. The biggest risk, in my opinion, is, what, is if we happen to botch the reopening of the economy. This is a real risk, as many states are reopening that have not flattened their inflection curves. Okay, I'm almost done. But first, I wanna make a few comments about growth stocks and how our growth portfolios are positioned. As some of you know, I am the director of the growth equity products. We have separate accounts and mutual fund offerings in both the domestic and global categories. Our portfolio management team, in addition to myself, consists of Caesar Bryan, who many of you know. We've, Caesar's been here 26 years. I've been here 25 years. 
Uh, Chris Ward is also a member of our team. He's been here five or six years. He'll be speaking later this morning about one of our software investments. So quickly, the economic ex expansion of the past decade averaged 2.2% GDP growth, slow growth. And slow growth brings low interest rates and those benefit growth stocks. So it's no surprise that growth stocks outperformed over this period. I believe slow growth and this trend will continue. Economic growth is limited by the number of workers times the output per worker or productivity. Our labor force is growing at about one half of 1% and increases in pro productivity are averaging less than 2%, usually more than a bit less than 2%, which makes it impossible to exceed 3% GDP growth for any length of time. In the last 20 years, we exceeded 3% GDP growth in only two years, 2000 and 2004. In contrast, during the 1990s, we had seven years of 3% growth and five of those exceeded 4%. Growth stocks are selling at a greater than usual premium today because investors are paying up for growth, stability, profitability, and strong balance sheets. If you compare the S&P 500 to the S&P 500 growth index, the growth index has a lower beta, it has lower debt to equity, a higher return on invested capital, and higher long-term growth estimates. Interest rates, those lowest interest rates in history that we've mentioned means the present value of future cash flows has never in history been higher. Low rates have supported and are supporting growth stock valuations, as is the increased scarcity of growth companies. In 1999, there were 165 companies in the S&P 500 with top line growth rates greater than 15%. Today, there are 50. Our growth portfolios were defensively positioned relative to the market for about 18 months. We own no energy, industrials, materials, or banks. This was due to our concern over the lagged impact of monetary policy tightening in 2018 and the related deterioration in global manufacturing PMIs. Growth did peak in the second quarter of 2018 and was in a slowing trend. With the market decline of, of March and April, we changed our strategy to be less defensive. We added some cyclical financial and industrial names to the portfolios and reduced our heavy weighting in lower beta stocks. The idea was to take advantage of the market's decline by purchasing beaten up stocks that should benefit from the expected second half recovery. Major growth themes are represented among our core holdings. Some of these themes have accelerated in the current environment. Such themes include the surging demand for e-commerce and related digital payments, the shift to digital ads and streaming media, as well as cloud computing. These are big changes and they are happening globally. Now, if you're thinking of that four letter acronym that starts with an F and rhymes with gang, yes, we own those stocks too, along with about 45 other high quality companies in a number of industries. About 90% of our portfolio is invested in information technology, healthcare, both pharma and med tech, iconic consumer names, and FinTech, the new term for technology businesses that masquerade as financial service companies. And all portfolios are the same, are managed the same subject to client restrictions. We're always looking for new growth investors. If you have any interest in growth, please seek your Gabelli representative. Thank you for your patience. And I will now turn the mic over to Paul again. Thank you.